this uh, issue has been around a long time and, and when genetically modified foods were introduced uh, as a science, as a technology, going back probably about 15 years ago, the Soil Association in the UK was one of the first organisations, organic organisations, that, that uh, exercised caution and said, we don't know enough about this and there's a principle called the precautionary principle that says where we don't fully understand the risks that we should, uh, we should not engage in the use of the technology. That's paraphrasing it. And that's been invoked by organic organisations in standards right around the world. And that's one of the key reasons why consumers over the last 10 or 15 years have turned to organic foods is because they are GMO free. And um, Arpit Pustai was the first scientist who alerted the public to potential harm about 11 or 12 years ago in the UK where he did research into potatoes with GM lectins. And he found some evidence of harm and he went public with that. Uh, and that created a storm of public protest which led to every supermarket chain in the UK rejecting GM foods over a period of about three months. And that uh, rejection followed to the food processors and manufacturers and it has literally gone and circled the globe. <laughs> and even today we have Coles supermarkets with a GM free policy for their home brand products. We see many food processors in Australia uh, that declare themselves GM free and you can get more information on this from the True Food Guide which um, is published on the Greenpeace website and that, that very clearly articulates the companies that have, have said they are GM free and the companies that have declined to answer the questions, so we just don't know whether they are using GM or not. Um, what, what I've done in establishing a research institute with Clive Blasey, who you might know from the Diggers Club, do you know the Diggers Club? Uh, and Patrick Holden from the Soil Association that I just mentioned, he's now left them very recently and we are working together in uh, the research area to fill the gaps and also to develop projects that um, support these issues. This is the issue that we are supporting our key project at the moment and we are coordinating fundraising so we would like you if you think this is an important issue to support Steve's case and you can donate to that fundraising effort. We need to raise many hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of the barristers costs and airfares for different experts and we have to pay experts to come and testify and give evidence. We have to raise those funds from uh, ethical businesses, from the public and from different philanthropic organisations. We've been very successful today. We've raised uh, the funds to, to uh, get Slater and Gordon to employ barristers for some months now who've been working on this case and they, they think it's a case well worth running and it will determine these rights, these common law rights that Steve and all of us enjoy. We all enjoy these rights. If your neighbour wants to throw uh, some herbicide over, over his fence onto your uh, vegetable garden or onto your uh, lawn and it kills that vegetable garden and kills that lawn, you've got the right under common law to uh, sue your, your neighbour or to ask your neighbour to compensate you for that damage. <laughs> Sometimes this happens inadvertently. Um, uh, you know, roots from trees go under fences and cause all sorts of problems. The common law is well established and it is the right place to take this action given that the legislation um, was, was, in our view, poorly constructed. And, and Steve is spot on when he talks about a need for a compensation fund. The GM farmer has the right under law in Australia to grow his crops. And Steve has the right under law in Australia to grow his organic crops that are GM free. How they coexist is a major, major issue. And hopefully this is the one and only case in Australia uh, that sees one farmer, Steve, so his neighbour, his neighbour that he's grown up with all his life and gone to school with and played tennis with and in the fire brigade with, uh, it's, it's a, a horrendous, um, it's the last resort, you know, it's not something that he wants to do, it's not something that we want to see him doing, uh, yet it's, it's bigger than him and it's bigger than his neighbour. This is an issue that affects all of us. Um, I wanted to sort of make one final comment about if you are interested in, in looking more at this, go to our website at safefoodfoundation.org. Uh, very easy to find if you do a Google search. But there is two papers that you should have a look at that are worth mentioning uh, published this year. One is, um, it's uh, a blood test study of Canadians, 69 Canadians. Martin, I'm not sure if you mentioned that in your talk. You did mention it. Um, so some of you might have heard Martin talk about that. Uh, it's looking at the presence of 
um, GM toxin in blood where the scientists who developed the technology thought that the tox breakdown in the human gut proved that hypothesis. They used digestive enzymes in test tubes and dropped the toxin into the test tubes. They found that the toxin was no longer present in those test tubes. Unfortunately, in my view, and I have a training in agricultural science, uh, what often we find in the laboratory takes place does not take place in real life. And in this situation, uh, the laboratory analysis has not occurred in real life. They looked at these Canadian women, 69 women, and uh, a number of those were pregnant, 30 of those were pregnant. 93% of those pregnant women carried the toxin in their blood. Uh, what is going on is the question. 80% of those uh, women who were pregnant were carrying the toxin in their umbilical blood into the developing fetus. And we all know that fetuses, as part of our developmental life cycle stage, is when we are most susceptible to toxins. Now, there is also evidence in laboratories where animals are fed GM foods that is showing that their reproduction is affected. So the second and third generation reproduction uh, is affected. Uh, is there a link? We don't know but it is serious cause for concern and there should be urgent and immediate research conducted uh, to determine whether there is a link. I don't want to eat GM foods. I don't want to have GM toxins circulating in my blood. And right now in North America, this is a fact. It's in the blood of North American people eating an average North American diet. They have this toxin circulating in their blood. In Australia, infant formula has been tested and has I, I believe is the results public on that, just not if they are, the results are public on that. They have found this GM toxin in infant formula in Australia. Soy-based infant formula, corn-based, I'm uh, sorry, corn. Uh, it's the particular GM corn which contains this toxin in North America. Corn is a precursor for so many food ingredients. You cannot imagine when you buy processed foods how many products are containing corn uh, and soybean products. Those are the two big crops in North America that are genetically modified and we should be alarmed. Uh, they are in our foods in Australia in small part, in North America in large part, in very large part. If you eat a good unprocessed food diet in, in Australia you will be largely avoiding GM foods. But even now our fish and chips through most of this country are being grown in uh, cottonseed oil. Unfortunately there is the particular type of um, toxin-based GM crops are used in Australia to grow cotton. So this toxin is potentially in our cotton seed oil which is used to cook our fish and chips, chips in Australia. So if you are buying fish and chips you might want to ask your fish and chip shop maker if they are using cotton seed oil. So th these are really serious issues. Is there any questions from Steve or, my, or myself before we um, move on to the next session? Uh, I mean, yeah, thank you for your attention on this. Um, got any questions from anyone? Yes, Alistair. Alistair has asked what will the likely outcome of the court case will be. Look, that's a crystal ball gazing question. Um, at the end of the day, uh, and Steve knows this better than me because I'm not privy to his commercial lawyer relationship, but as I understand it, the lawyers have advised him uh, that, that he should proceed with this case. Um, and. I've been involved in different legal cases over time and uh, um, uh, one of them was when I was sued because I spoke out in the public interest um, about a real concern about a company's operations on the ABC and they slapped a lawsuit on me and they slapped a lawsuit on the ABC and that was to try and shut me up. Uh, they eventually lost that bit of litigation many years later. So lawyers, if they advise you to take a case forward, they only do that if they think there's a case to be run. We think there's, this is a, you know, it, it, on the basis of it, there's a good case to be run. The precedents of negligence and uh, nuisance are well established in Australian law. What's different is the factual matrix. Uh, we had our lawyer here, Slater and Gordon's lawyer was here yesterday, and that's what he's told the organic industry representatives that we met with yesterday, that the facts are different, but the precedents are well established, that, that farmers have a duty of care to their neighbour, you have a duty of care to your neighbour. And that's, that's well established in Australian law. Uh, it's, you know, it may go to the High Court, it may not. It may be resolved. It will take 12 to 18 months to come to court. If you know about litigation, these things move fairly slowly. 
the fact that Steve has announced it uh, is creating waves in agricultural Australia right now. It's been talked about, you know, around hotels all over this country in rural Australia now. And farmers should be talking about it and should be thinking very carefully before they make a decision whether uh, to harvest their GM crops that are in the ground this year or whether they should plough those crops under or whether they should grow GM canola next year. Unfortunately, it is grown in New South Wales, it is grown in Victoria and it is grown in Western Australia. It's a, it's a sad fact uh, and it was inevitable that this would happen. And there will be a lot more of, of Steve's type of cases unless some um, uh, reality comes to bear on this situation. So, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, we haven't got a petition yet, but I think that that will be an inevitable um, uh, part ca thing coming out of this. It, this is a public interest case, and, and public interest cases uh, uh, should uh, put pressure on legislators to fix the problem. And this is a problem. And you know, I feel for Steve, and I feel for his neighbour. His neighbour did what the rules allowed him to do. So you know, I, I mean, there's a lot more detail than that, but I, I feel for both of them. And uh, this, this is something legislators have to fix up and that's why petitions uh, will ultimately be very important in, in getting our legislators to understand this is an issue. We managed to speak uh, yesterday morning with Malcolm Turnbull who came here uh, and addressed the exhibitors at 7.30 in the morning and that was, um, you know, it was pleasing to see him give, up, give us his full attention for about um, 10 minutes yesterday morning on that issue. Um, you know, I, I, I personally, um, uh, you know, I think the legislators generally uh, get brought to account uh, when things go wrong by the public and we have to drag them to fix the problems and I think that's what's happening now and we, we're starting to tap on their shoulders uh, and let them know there is a problem. Steve's certainly done that in Western Australia with his legislators over there and uh, we rely upon you, the public. So we'll de be developing the Safe Food Foundation. We'll be developing um, um, particular solutions to this problem, which we'll be asking you, the public, over time. It's going to take us time to develop our sophisticated uh, website and so on. Our website's under development now. But we'll be developing solutions that you can support as well. And um, no, it's a really, it's, it's a, it, there is going to be good come out of this. It's, it's hard for Steve to probably see that at the moment. He's probably quite concerned and his time's been taken up and his farm's been neglected and he's spent a lot of his own money to date. And we are now taking that burden off his shoulders. So we will raise the funds that we need and we expect the public to dig deep and, and come forth and help out. And, uh, and, and, you know, there's a very good opportunity to resolve this issue favourably for our rights. Just imagine if a court found that no, Steve doesn't have the right to grow, go, grow GM free. Imagine the outcry that would come when the evidence of harm is building, the public is going to be increasingly alerted to evidence of harm. You can go to our website, there's more than 70 papers there, scientific papers and other literature reviews of scientific papers, which are in some form or another indicating evidence of harm. So. It's well established now that evidence of harm, and the public's only going to become increasingly um, concerned and will increasingly reject GM food. So if, if we are told by the courts, sorry, you have to eat it, uh, take your GM toxin, we're not going to be happy about that. And that, that will create a storm of controversy. So uh, this will be resolved one way or the other. Um, we hope and pray that it will be resolved by the courts in a favourable way and you know the advice is that this is a case well worth running. Next question.